So welcome, Bethany. Thanks, Jennifer. I'm so excited to be here today. So I reached out to you because I want to know how you got into intuitive eating. Yeah, that's a, a long story. But when I, so I went into undergrad studying nutrition, dietetics, and through that, I, you know, let me start actually the reason I got into nutrition and dietetics was because I wanted to manipulate my own weight. Um, That was the whole reason I felt like if I studied this, I would find the secret of weight loss and nobody would ever have any issues with their body again, because I, I genuinely thought that the, the secret to improved body image was weight loss. Um, And through that was my own disordered eating and internalized fat phobia. And so all through undergrad, I really stayed on that track of weight centric um, teaching, which is what nutrition um, courses are. (laughs) They are very weight centric. And so I don't remember ever maybe a, a class about intuitive eating, but I was not in a place where I was, I could accept that information. I was very like macro tracking is the only way. It wasn't until I graduated from undergrad, um, it was probably three months after undergrad, I stumbled upon a weight inclusive dietitian or a health at every size dietitian. And she was talking about intuitive eating. And at this point, I was pretty exhausted with tracking macros. I took a break. I was like, I just can't do this. I can't like keep obsessing. Like I can't keep weighing myself and feeling guilty about all this I was exhausted and so it was kind of perfect timing which seems to happen right (laughs) and so I fell upon her podcast and I remember listening to it while at work I was a kitchen manager at the time and I was cutting vegetables and by myself and I just started crying when I heard her talking about intuitive eating and this different way of eating which I never really thought about like I remember being in high school when I was still very disordered around food and like thinking to myself wow I wish I could eat like I was six again like that was so amazing and you know maybe that was the intuitive side of me being like well there is another way but you're just not ready to hear it and and so I finally heard it and it was just I just dove deep in and I I looked up the research I looked up um I listened to every podcast, I read every book, and I was like, this is, this is it, like, this makes so much sense. Do you want me to keep going, kind of go off on a spiral? I (laughs) I want to know it all. (laughs) Okay, good. Um, And so it made so much sense to me in that time, when studying nutrition, so you have to become a dietitian, you have to go to school for a bachelor's, and then you have to do supervised practice. And that's 1,200 hours of supervised practice. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unpaid, by the way. Let's add that one. It is not paid. <laughs> um, and so I still had to do that. So I had my bachelor's. But after learning about intuitive eating, I, I didn't know what to do. I was like, well, how can I pursue being a dietitian if all I've been taught was this weight-centric approach? And I keep saying weight-centric, which is the concept that practitioners use weight loss as a prescription. So they always, they think that the thinner you are, the healthier you are. And that's what I was taught. That's what was constantly taught to me. And I remember a little bit of a trigger warning about what I'm about to say, but I remember in undergrad, one of my professors told another student who lived in a larger body that nobody will listen to a fat dietitian. Like that's, (laughs) <laughs> that's how fat phobic my undergrad was that I I was in this place, you know, 2021, 20, like, wh- what do I do? What do I do with my life? If this is all I've known, but research is telling me otherwise. And so I took a year off. And I thought to myself, like, I can't, I, I really don't know. To, I don't know what to do. So I thought about becoming an OT. I thought about becoming a speech language pathologist, but this would be years and years of school. And I finally talked to a health at every size dietitian. And I I was like, I'm lost. I I need help. Like, I I don't know how to be this. And she was like, you see what I do. She's like, I'm a private practice dietitian and I help people 
learn about intuitive eating and move away from being obsessed with their body size. And then I was like, well, I guess that's what I'll do. <laughs> and so, I mean, I knew that I was private practice would be something I'd wanted, but I was like, at least at this point, like I know I can do something that's not going to continue to go against my own beliefs. Um, so that's kind of the gist. <laughs> so did, did you get through those 1200 hours? Yeah. Yep. So I decided to apply for internships and a lot of internships. So, well, unfortunately by 2024, you have to have a master's to become a dietitian. And I say, unfortunately, because this continues to exclude people that should be a dietitian. Cause if we're looking at, there's only about 3% of non-white dietitians out there. So if we're going to continue to raise the ladder for dietitians, that's going to continue to reduce the amount of people that come in to the field. Um, I don't know how I got there, but I, <laughs> um, but I decided to apply for internships. I did the internship and a master's program. That was my point. Uh, it was a combined, combined um, program and it was a distance program, which means that I would pick, I picked my own preceptors to do my supervised practice, which was helpful because it gave me a little bit more, I could be a little pickier on who I worked with and kind of made sure that it wasn't like a, a bariatric center. Like it at least would be something that wouldn't be as hard for me to deal with. I will say it had, it was difficult. I mean, I, as an intern, you know, not only are these people telling you like, you know, you have to do what they say. Like you can't, I mean, you can, you can push back, but at the same time, like they're doing you a favor. And I couldn't just be like, um, well, that's wrong. Like that's wrong. Like I just felt like I had to be two different people and just be like, okay, sure. You're right. Like let's prescribe weight loss. And it really didn't become more difficult until I got into my clinical rotation. And that's a lot of push to tell people to lose weight. And I did everything I could to avoid the O word. Um, I would just like use different, I would always use different words. I would always, even in like writing notes, clinical notes, I wouldn't use the O word. Um, and I don't think, I never even talked to any of the dietitians about health at every size because sometimes weight centric dietitians can get, I don't know, a little upset about it, which, which only shows their internalized fat phobia. And I'm like, how can you get upset about treating people right? Like, I don't know how that is an argument, um, but that, that was hard. It was really difficult for me to act like two different people because I like being myself, you know, <laughs> I, I enjoy myself and um, yeah, but I conquered, I got it done and here we are I, and a registered dietitian and I, no longer have to do that. So it's, it's been quite the journey to say the least. So what are some of the main differences between like your schooling registered dietitian and the intuitive eating world? Like how does that, what are the differences for people that don't know? Sure. Um, okay. So I feel like a lot of people have probably heard of like my plate, which is the concept. It used to be the food pyramid, which then they changed it. I don't remember when to my plate. So the concept to have like a perfect plate is what's taught. <laughs> like a dietitian will teach you to have a perfect plate. Well, in an intuitive eating world, I'm not going to tell you what to eat. What I'm going to teach you is how to listen to your body and what is your body telling you is perfect for you. What sounds good to you instead of this arbitrary plate telling you how many servings you should eat and always reading labels. You know, that was a big push is teach people to read labels, fix the O word epidemic, like all these things that was constantly pushed on the weight centric education. Um, and again, not, not many people at least in my undergrad talked about health at every size. Now in grad school, I was a little bit more, um, I was in a place where I could talk back a little bit more with my professors and challenge their thoughts. I even had to have a phone call with one of my professors because she felt like I was hurting a guest speaker's 
feelings. And I was like, you're an educator. If you cannot have a conversation with a student that goes against your beliefs, then maybe what you're teaching is very biased. And, um, you know, it was good to challenge that. And it was exciting. I was able to bring in a health at every size dietitian into grad school and talk about that. But, you know, it's, there's not many schools out there that are teaching health at every size and, um, and not focusing on weight. Does that answer the question? I mean, yeah. there's so many reasons that, that, that are different between that weight centric intuitive eating and health at every size that it's almost hard to pull them all apart because there's so many. But it sounds like you're trusting more of what your body is telling you. You're actually re getting in touch with those cues yeah. that we lose being a chronic plate eater yeah. <laughs> my plate eater <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah intuitive eating is really focusing on what your body needs versus what an external influence is telling you and an external influence would be like a label instead of saying oh well this uh box of cereal says that I can only have a third of a cup <laughs> you can decide or whatever it says um you can decide however much you want because that's what's going to make you feel good and actually satisfy you. And, and so it's moving away from this concept that everything else knows more than what your body knows and moving away from tracking food because for some reason people are really pushed to track food and, and little do they know it's just not, your body knows so much more than what any app will ever be able to tell you. So when you get people into your space, into your practice, are you getting people that have been like yo-yoing through weight cycling and dieting and like, where are they coming in to like your process? Yeah, I think it, it I mean, it depends on the person. Um, everyone comes in kind of in a different place, but yeah, many people are chronic dieters. Like they have spent years dieting and they're tired of it. They're sick of it. They're sick of being told that their body is wrong. They're sick of having to lose weight and then gaining weight and lose weight and gaining weight. So weight cycling, they're exhausted and they feel like they feel like that they've been told for so long that their body is wrong and to keep losing weight. And then they don't, and then they feel like a failure. And so their whole lives have been centered around feeling like a failure. And finally, they're in a place where, excuse me, they realize there's another side. And that is not blaming your body and learning to listen to your body instead of those external influences, which takes time. And, and everyone that comes in is kind of in a different place of where that might be, whether they're 60 years old and have been dieting since they were 10, or they are 28 years old and have been dieting for five years. But that's still, five years still takes a toll on you and to figure out how do you even listen to your body? What does hunger even feel like? Which may seem strange to people for like, because there's people out there that just not been affected by diet culture, which is amazing. Um, and so if they hear the question, what does hunger feel like? They're just like, well, that's a stupid question. And it's like, well, it's not because so many of us were taught to eat gum or drink water or go for a walk when you feel hunger that you don't even know what hunger actually feels like unless your stomach is screaming at you. So what is the first part, like first thing that you go over with people when they're entering into leaving diet culture or whatever you want to call it, the Western world of eating <laughs> and then moving into this more intuitive approach? Like what's the first step that you would, would suggest somebody would, would go on? Mm hmm you know, again, it kind of goes on to what the person is at, but I would say a lot of the times a good place to start is giving yourself permission to eat and, and deciding that you don't have to tell yourself, no, I shouldn't eat that. You just eat it. Like give yourself, allow yourself to eat foods that you like, which is really scary for a lot of people, because again, we have a lot of, our culture is afraid of larger bodies, that's what we've been taught, is to be afraid of that. And so the concept of allowing yourself to eat is really hard for people to work through because they're afraid of weight gain. And I'm like, but you're gonna gain so many things if you give yourself permission to eat. And so deciding 
you know, maybe like they look in the fridge and there's a piece of cake and carrots. And usually they'd be like, oh, I don't want to eat the cake. I'll just, or I want to eat the cake, but I have to eat the carrots because it's quote unquote good. And, you know, give, giving their self permission to eat would be, well, I really want the cake. I'm going to eat the cake, you know, and, and kind of working through those conversations in their head. And they might feel guilt, but that's where, you know, intuitive eating counselor or coach can come in and be like, well, where do you think that go that guilt stems from? Why do you feel so much guilt when you eat things that you want? Where is that stemming from? So does intuitive eating have the labels of like good and bad, just like other industries or is all food just food? Yeah, I mean, there it's definitely moving away from the concept that food is good or bad and finding a place of like food neutrality, realizing that all food has a benefit. And I, I remember listening to one dietitian talk about this and it really made sense to me. So let's say it's breakfast and you're running late for work and you have the option of grabbing a donut or a banana. Diet culture would tell you, well, grab the banana because it's healthy. But let's think about that. Is a banana going to really hold you over if you, like, let's say you work at a corporate job and you can only eat lunch at 12 o'clock and it's eight o'clock. Is a banana going to hold you over for four hours? Probably not. I mean, a donut probably won't either for me, <laughs> but, but it's a better chance that that donut is going to hold you over longer than a banana because a donut has fat, it has carbohydrates, where a banana just has carbohydrates that's not going to keep you satisfied for a very long time, you know? And so it's realizing like all food will have a benefit, whether that's mentally or physically, it's important to give yourself again that permission to eat so that no food feels like it's off limit and you feel like you go crazy around some of your favorite foods. And is that where our cravings normally come from? By avoiding our favorite yeah. foods? Yeah, a lot of that is. I mean, of course, cravings come, a lot of us for women, it comes when, you know, we're about to start our period. We have more cravings because we have increased hormones. But, but when we have our cravings will become worse if we're not giving ourselves permission to eat the foods that we like. So if you really want a donut and you keep telling yourself, no, I won't eat a donut. That chant, when you do get the opportunity to eat a donut, you're probably going to go crazy on the donut and eat a whole box of donuts. Whereas an intuitive eater probably would only eat one donut, you know? And so it's, it's taking the novelty out of food. And instead of feeling like you can only have your favorite foods on special occasions, knowing you can have your favorite foods whenever you want, it's what your body decides. And I noticed when I started the intuitive eating journey, I let go of all the food rules and I started eating all of those quote unquote forbidden foods. And mm -hmm. I overate them till I was sick. Mm -hmm. And then now it's like, oh, do I actually like those things? Or were they just, again, that novelty piece? Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting how, I mean, we wouldn't have such a multi-billion dollar industry for weight loss if this stuff worked or if it was even necessary it's just it's a business, a business mm -hmm. not truly honoring our body yeah yeah and that's and that's the thing is and that's what we have to always remember when we decide to go on a, a weight loss journey or to decide to lose weight we have to remember who's benefiting from that not us but diet culture sure is because it's I mean, it's like almost an $80 billion industry. Don't quote me, but I know it's, it's, it's growing. And, and so that's, that's, what's benefiting is the industry, not you. Cause you're going, you're, you are going to fail at the diet and it's not because you are failing. It's because your body's smarter than you think it is. And it doesn't want to lose weight. We're not designed to lose weight. So how are you blending in your practice, the dietitian? with the intuitive eating? Like, what does that blend look like? Yeah, that's a good question. Cause it's actually interesting that you bring that up because the few people I've talked to the past couple of days on social media, their instant thought of a dietitian is that they're gonna tell you exactly what to eat and you're doing it all wrong. 
and I don't need someone else to tell me how to nourish your body and or my body and it makes me sad that that's how people see dietitians because there are so many dietitians out there that aren't like that. Um, and so it's kind of moving away from that concept that dietitians are only here to tell you how to lose weight and to eat the perfect diet. And instead focusing on me teaching you as a dietitian how to listen to your body and what what everything feels like, what does hunger feel like? What does hopefulness feel like to you? Cause every person's gonna be different. And, and so I am a tool to teach you, what does it feel like to be in your body? Like, what are those sensations that are happening? Because our bodies are constantly telling us something constantly like we that's how we survive is by our body communicating with us but so many of us have turned that off and aren't listening and so as a dietitian I can teach you reteach you because everyone's born able to listen to their body it just depends on you know from when you were born to where you are now what kind of happens and and so I can help you get to that place where you realize wow, like I know I'm hungry when I start thinking about food, which is a common one. People will think about food and that that's a good sign that they're probably hungry. Or if somebody starts salivating in their mouth, they notice that they're, they're getting um, saliva, that's a good chance that they're hungry too. They're starting to think about food. And so it's these subtle sensations where people can start to learn about their bodies. And that even goes to just taking care of yourself. I think in our culture, I know in our culture, we're obsessed with productivity. And if you take a minute back and realize what your body needs, you'll probably realize that your body is not doing great working 12 hour days. I understand that that can be a privilege in itself. Sometimes we have to work long hours, but if you have the opportunity to step back and realize what your body needs, that's good. And even if you do work 12 hours, making boundaries for yourself that you make sure that you're fed, you make sure that you get water. Maybe you make sure you step out of the office and take a walk outside, checking in with yourself and really learning about your body. And, and that's what I can do as a, I call myself an anti-diet dietitian. So that's what I can do to support you. And, and that's what many other dietitians are doing. And of course, there are still dietitians out there that are going to tell you to lose weight. And, and they're still on that weight-centric approach. I'm hoping that we continue to move away from that. Me too. I know that for <laughs> me, I just had a doctor's appointment because of, you know, lovely uh, COVID being at home. Everything's been online. So I didn't have to get on the scale. Mm -hmm. And it was the first appointment in 10 years that because all my labs were perfect and everything, we didn't talk about weight loss and we actually had a good conversation. And I think that's one of the things that's coming from us all being quote unquote stuck at home mm -hmm. that we are looking for new ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that because that is so true. So often people will go to the office, the doctor's office, they get weighed. And then the, the first conversation is weight loss. And it's like, okay, doc, can we look at everything else? And nothing is indicating weight loss here. And nor does it ever indicate weight loss because weight loss is very harmful for your body. And so remembering that, but besides the point. Um, <laughs> and, and so it is, it's, I hope that we continue to get more physicians out there that even understand how harmful diets are and actually focus on things we can change because weight is not a behavior even though some people believe it is, we can't really control our body weight. And so focusing on things that we can control, which a big one is stress management. I mean, so many of us are so overwhelmed, especially with COVID and the election, which is going on while we're talking, <laughs> while this is being recorded. Um, and so it, we are all very, very stressed out. So instead of putting your body in more stress, which would be weight loss, maybe think about things that would make you feel good, which could be maybe taking a little break from work or going for a walk or whatever that sounds good to you enjoying that piece of cake with no shame or guilt <laughs> yes exactly exactly good addition that's exactly did you end up changing doctors or was this just a good this was good just appointment a perfect appointment like I've been seeking doctors for a long time because I've like if there's nothing that's showing up 
like as an actual confirmed diagnosis, why does it matter? And I've been telling my doctors this for years. Like, why does it matter what size I am? I'm Mm -hmm. active. I'm enjoying my life. The only time that I'm not okay is when I'm on a diet. Like that's when my numbers get screwed up in my labs. And it was just happened that I didn't have to get on the scale. Mind you, I never knew I could tell them I don't want to get on the scale when you go. Mm -hmm. It was an actual like conversation. Like I was a human. I wasn't just this. Mm. Oh, you call it the O word, you know, like morbidly O word that she wanted Mm -hmm. to tell me about. And it was, it was actually like the first conversation with a Western medicine doctor that I've had in years that I felt like a human. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That is a good point because that, that's what so many of the doctors that focus on weight loss is they are dehumanizing people that live in larger bodies and deciding that, oh, well, you know, the, whatever is going on is only going on because you're in that size body. And it is just, it's so unfair to people that live in larger bodies that, and, and this goes to a lot of marginalized bodies. It's not just people in larger bodies, but they're told because of this, that's why this is happening when that's just not true. And that's not the case. And that continues to dehumanize people and, and realize like, I, I, I don't know, it's just really sad to think about that's how people practice and that's just not how people should be treated and I talked about this the other day too is discrimination is legal when it comes to larger bodies people are allowed to deny you work based on your body size that's not a written anywhere that's not illegal um you know like it is if you're a certain age you you can't oh an employer can't decide to not hire you because you're a certain age, that is illegal. Of course it happens. But if you live in a larger body, somebody can make that decision and that sucks. Like that shouldn't be the case. That shouldn't be happening. You shouldn't be denied insurance coverage because of the size of your body. Like that is not a health marker. And we need to move away from that and move to a place where we realize weight is not a behavior. And instead focusing on that, focusing on again, things that we can change which eat food without guilt. (laughs) And and that kind of goes into like how harmful weight stigma is too, which can affect people's labs and and, um, how they feel about themselves in general. Because if a doctor's, every time you go to the doctor, somebody tells you to lose weight, odds are one, you might not go to the doctor again and continue to have whatever's going on. Or maybe later on something goes on, but you're afraid to go to the doctor because you don't want them to tell you, oh, well, you gained weight, your body sucks because that doesn't feel good. And so that's where weight stigma can be really harmful as well as we know stigma in general is very harmful. And, and so that is, that is going to affect our labs and that's going to hurt us. And so it's not the body weight itself, but it's, it's the stigma that comes with that. That's going to continue to hurt our health. Yeah. It really messes with your mental health which I think mm-hmm. is like that critical component, like before anything else, if your mental health isn't right, doesn't matter what you're eating or what you're doing, nothing mm-hmm. else in your life is going to find that, that balance or whatever. You, I hate the word balance, but I, <laughs> diet culture ruined that word, didn't it? Yeah. I'm like, I hate that word, but I don't know a different word for it. Mm-hmm. I know. I know. And that's, I mean, there's so many things diet culture has ruined and unfortunately balance is, is one of those words, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's really a disservice we've done for people since the focus on weight loss. And that's been around for a very long time, a very long time. And I mean, I think fat activists came out in the fifties. I think that's when the conversation really started where people realize like, this is not right. Um, And I wanna make sure for your listeners, you know, when I say the word fat, I'm using it as a neutral descriptor, just like we use the word thin. Um, and, And so people are working on taking the stigma out of the word fat. And of course, this is dependent on the person if that's how they wanna describe themselves or, or not, uh, never use that word unless you are given uh, to describe somebody unless you are given the permission to do so because that word has been used to attack people's bodies. But there are many people out there that have decided to use the word fat to describe themselves. 
So I love being in your space because it's, it is this body neutral. It's, it's a positive uplifting. Like I feel like I can eat all the things and there's no shame in it. Where can people find you? Yeah. So people can find me. I am on Facebook, uh, Bethany Kanashjuk. Uh, I, I'm sure Jennifer will have that written because that's a, that's a big last name. Uh, so you can find me on there. I have a Facebook group, which is food freedom support community, which I'm always, always want people to, to join that. Um, and then I also am on Instagram, which is imperfect nutrition. And so I am constantly posting on both social media sites. And I love connecting with people. So if you're listening and you want to message me, email me, like, let's talk. I, I want to be here as a support system for so many people. And that's how I found you and how I ended up reaching out was it was right before you were getting married. You were mentioning mm-hmm. stuff about like this, the, the weight stigma around being a bride and how mm-hmm. you have to, like a lot of brides show up and want to buy a dress two sizes smaller because they're going to make it there. And I just remember these posts and it wasn't written in a way that you would normally expect to see a dietitian write this. Mm-hmm. Like you mm-hmm. have to get down to the size. It was written in a way like, no, by the size you are now because you're enough now. And I just, I yeah. love the, like how the community is that you're bringing and what you're bring the messages you're bringing out into the social world. Cause it needs it. It needs the change. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, Jennifer. And I mean, that is so true to just go on a quick tangent about brides. You do not need to lose weight for your wedding. I didn't lose weight. I know I live in a mid-sized body and I have a lot of privilege in my body, but I couldn't imagine going on a weight loss diet and planning a wedding. You know, there was COVID on top of that, which was crazy. Um, And so if I was trying to lose weight, I think I would have lost my mind. I felt like I did lose my mind a little bit with wedding planning. Um, And so you, you do not need to lose weight and wedding dresses are a scam in general, but you know, whatever. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But they they size wedding dresses, uh, like two to four sizes under what you usually are too, just to mess you up even more. So Find, if you're a bride, find a place that is inclusive and doesn't even focus on sizes because that's what I had found was um, a bridal shop that their sizes were like beautiful, gorgeous. And they went up, they had, I think they started in double zero all the way to maybe 40. So a big variety of wedding dresses and you didn't even know what you were putting on until you bought it. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So if somebody walked away with just one thing, what would you want them to walk away? What, what golden nugget would you want them to walk away with from this interview? I would say the biggest thing is your body is not a problem. Your body is exactly the way it's supposed to be. And I mean this in a weight loss way. You do not need to lose weight to fit a certain mold, to fit the thin ideal. Your body is the size that it needs to be for you to be healthy and you don't need to continue to to make your life miserable by trying to lose weight you can be where you are and you can take up space and you can be loud and you can be proud especially as a female i think it's so easy for women to feel like they need to continue to be smaller and smaller and talk smaller and quieter but you don't need to you can show up as you are and and stop letting diet culture take your life away from it Oh, I never thought it about it that way. Like the taking up space, like we're trying to make ourselves small to fit in. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. That like, <laughs> I'm like, mic drop, we're done. <laughs> but wow. Like I never thought of. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I have yeah. To say. It's, wow. <laughs> it's just another way that the patriarchy has continued to make women smaller is through weight loss and to make women quieter and women need to keep showing up as they are and and be loud and tell people to stop talking when they're talking over you and and be the person that you are because because if we continue to let diet culture make us small that's that's just going to continue to overshadow us when we have so many things to get done and so many things we can accomplish as females so do you think now that like the health at every size and all these other body positive things, do you think that we're moving in that direction of like making a bigger change worldwide? 
the optimist optimism in me wants to say yes um i do think we have a long way to go and which i'm happy to do the fight that you know but it's it is a long way to go to a place where more people kind of grasp this i i will say there are more um schools teaching about health at every size and and so the conversation is starting and there are more new dietitians and RDs to be that want to learn about this and move into this approach. So I can only hope that we continue to do that and realize that all bodies are good bodies, but I think we have a long way to go. And <laughs> I hate, I hate thinking like that, but it's just, it's just the truth. And I think like so often, like I know I can get in my bubble of like, health at every size, everybody. And then when you leave that bubble, you're like, whoa, we've got some, we've got some work to do. <laughs> That's for sure. And it shows up in crazy places, I find. <laughs> it, it sure does. It knows. I mean, one of the places that is always interesting to me is with animals. Cause I think so often, I know it's a, it's an interesting concept. I'm an animal lover. So, um, so often I'll hear people like even yesterday I took my dog to the vet and we we have another dog that is a herding dog and so therefore we have to be very active family um probably more active than I really want to be but whatever um and and so with him the vet had told us that well he's put on 10 pounds and he really cannot gain any more weight and he I'm like he is the pit of me of health and you're going to sit here and tell me that he needs to not gain any weight well, what if his body needs to gain weight and and i know this can get kind of tricky but people put a lot of their own fat phobia into animals and and put animals on diets and i just think that i know this is a whole other subject but oh, <laughs> I, it just <laughs> i didn't even just, realize it spilled out into our animal world the, it sure does. It's like, it's like, what? I just don't understand why we need to continue to control everybody's body weight and not just let animals bodies be and people's bodies be like, this is, this is the size that they want to be at. And yeah, it's pretty crazy to me. <laughs> um, and the comments people make into animals, it's, yeah, it's it, talk about showing up in weird places. That's a weird place for it to show up. Yeah, that's another one I would have never thought to. It's sad. It it makes it makes my heart kind of sad to see that it shows up like that much and controls yeah. that much. And all we can do is put, like we said, like how I, why I created this is so that we can make one little step and together we can make a tsunami of change because it yes. does change. But it is so exciting to hear that in the RD, like the actual Western world, that they're starting to put a little bit of this health at every size and intuitive eating in it because, I mean, there just isn't enough of it. And being drugged through it all my life as a larger child, I, it would have been so much nicer to be brought up with something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that, I mean, that's a, whew. That, that was the lecture that I got really upset about where she was talking about childhood O-word. And oof, I got, I got worked up and that's why I had to have a private conversation with my professor because I was like, how dare you tell a two-year-old that they need to lose weight? I mean, that is inhumane and unethical. And it just, for it to show up in childhood is so unfair. And I'm sorry that you have those experiences and, and, and it's just children are children. Children should be able to be in their bodies and not worry about it. But so many women and men and, and everyone in between deal with that as a kid and told that they need to lose weight at 10 years old, like five years old, even yeah. it, it just doesn't make any sense to me at all. Yeah. Well, hopefully this will be the start of something new and, you know, in the years to come, we'll start seeing more of more people come out. I know that at least in my internal bubble, I've seen a lot more health at every size dietitians and doctors. Mm -hmm. And that's been so exciting to, to share that. And that's why I wanted to share your story and your message with 
this audience because it is an important change and it's an important thing that needs to come and the peace that comes with the intu in intuitive eating. I have so much more time. It's ridiculous how much time I have when I'm not tracking and planning and mm -hmm. dwelling and worrying and all of that stuff. So it's like, you just have time for fun. It's, it's yeah. Yeah, you have time to live and just be present and everything else that matters, which is the point. That's that's the point of what I do as a dietitian is I free up space in your brain so that you can do the things that really matter, like be a wife or a husband, to be an animal lover, you know, rescue all the animals you want to rescue, like focus on that instead of manipulating your body size, because that doesn't matter. Nobody's going to talk about your body size when you're in the grave they're going to talk about the things you did and the experiences you had well I am so excited and I really appreciate you coming on today and sharing this and I will make sure to get all your information in the show notes because like I said I think that what you're doing and the fact that you have that more rigid western approach with this beautiful intuitive blended together I think it's going to be magic that you're going to create thank you Jennifer I really appreciate it and I really appreciate you inviting me to come on and I'm glad we finally were able to do it. Me too.